right. Welcome back to Sky Shower. This is Noah. And this is Jesse. All right, Jesse. So <laughs> uh, we, uh, we uh, kind of got off to a rough start tonight. Um, our very first take. <laughs> our very first take had the cameras rolling, but uh, the audio wasn't going. And we've never had anything but a first take. <laughs> this is a first, you know, for us two months in. <laughs> uh, so any case, uh, how, was, how was your week last week? Oh, it was a busy and hectic week. I'm excited for spring. Have been doing some yard work, watering, fertilizing, mowing my lawn. Front's perfectly green. Wrapping up the back, we'll get there. Um, but looking forward to planting some flowers, some color, some, uh, you know, wilderness, bouncing around, birds flying, bunnies mating, who knows what I'll see. <laughs> Deers eating my roses, usually. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds good. Sounds deer. good. How about just deer eating my roses? Deer, stop eating my rose. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you know, as far as like uh, weather wise goes, or or seasons, I'm not a huge fan of spring. I love summer. Summer is my favorite time of the year. Fall is my second favorite. But spring, it seems like. One day it's 70 degrees or 80 degrees and sunny. And I'm like, yes, summertime is almost here. And then the next day it's snowing and it's freaking cold and there's ice on the roads. So as far as I'm concerned, I am uh, more of a summer fan, but springtime does indicate it is around the corner. So, you know, I guess there's that for spring. Uh, But you said you had a pretty busy week. It was, uh, you know, work always keeps me busy. My time with my kids, I always love cherish. I I don't even know if keeping busy is the appropriate term because it's all pleasure. And uh, then really just, you know, stuff around the house, getting this yard ready for summer, as you will. I agree with that. Fire pit, fire, you know. Fire, fire, fire. fire. (laughs) (laughs) Who doesn't love some fire? Grilling. Lounging out till 9 p.m. Oh, because talk, talk about grilling. Sorry, oh. I'm changing the topic now. Yeah, man, you're good. Uh, talking about grilling, we had an awesome dinner tonight. It was a uh, lobster tail. Yeah. Uh, steak. What kind of steak? It was sirloin? That was filet. Okay, filet. Uh, you know, uh, the market definitely, you know, it was good. It was not great. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you had asparagus on there. Asparagus with some bolognese sauce and some potatoes. And potatoes. It was pretty bomb. It was delicious. Um, it was good. And then uh, we had uh, a Zinfandel, right? Yes, Coppola. that was the Coppola Zin. Great with most of the dinner. Um, I, next time I would prefer a cab. Yeah. You know, as far as like Coppola's go, I like the Claret a lot. Claret is my favored. Favorite? <laughs> favorite. <laughs> oh, it is man. the favorite wine of yeah. the Coppola's. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Or favorite. Black bottle, gold fish net. Who doesn't want it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a it's a very good bottle. I like that one. All right. Very tasty. Well, um, this evening. We're going to, you know, our journey this evening is with the, the, Glen, the Glen Fittick 12 year original single malt scotch whiskey. And this is a Space Side aged in Oloroso sherry and bourbon casks. Well, since we've already tasted it. <laughs> <laughs> first pour, first go. We got, uh, you know, Darth Vader ice cubes. Dom, 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 dom. And uh, Darth Vader pretty much killed us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Since we weren't able to get our recording started uh, with uh, our are video. Are we recording this time? Yes. Okay. Uh, we are actually four minutes and 12 seconds in. Ah! And we have one camera still working. <laughs> video! And sound, <laughs> so we're good. So, wow. uh, <laughs> so let's, let's chalk up what we got so far. Uh, one, we lost the camera. <laughs> camera turned off. Uh, the uh, the laptop that we use, uh, the hard drive is now is unreadable. So <laughs> Dal is coming out to fix that. And uh, three, we started uh, the evening without hitting the record button for the audio. So, um. I think we're we're uh, hitting on all cylinders almost. <laughs> yeah, four of twelve. 
Uh, all right. Um, so some of the some of the tasting about the Glenfiddich Twelve. Um, you know, first of all, you shared with me that very interesting note that this is the largest produced twelve year Scotch on the planet. So arguably the most consumed 12 year scotch <laughs> on the planet. Well, one would tend to think that if it is the most produced. <laughs> we're, we're here to decide if this is the most enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, in our first taste, <laughs> <laughs> I oh. did mention that uh, I did get um, hints of uh, apple pie with the finish having kind of like a crust or a honeydew. Yes, a uh, great golden pie crust color. Though. Yeah, great golden color. Uh, for me, a little hot, definitely those citrus, sweet citrus popping out at the beginning, um, mellows out pretty well with that malty uh, pie crust flavor right. and then wraps up super smooth, almost too smooth. Yeah, I would say it does finish off pretty smooth. I can see why it's probably one of the most produced um, 12-year-olds. Um, it's not going to knock your socks off. Um, but it's not going to disappoint either. That's right. One of the reasons we went with this one this evening was trying a 12-year, very affordable 12-year, right around that $40 mark. Right, and also it's a new uh, new location, right? A new, uh, how would you say? Because we went Highlands, uh, Isla. Isla, and now this is, uh, what was it? Speyside. Speyside. So, so a new territory. Yeah. Um, great bottle, actually. I like the uh, triangle shape, if you will, the rounded triangle. Good for gripping if you're doing some wet work. Uh, good packaging from a selling point. Not an unattractive bottle to have on your shelf. Yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, I know you said when you first tasted it, it seemed a little bit hot. But uh, you, knowing me, because I get the cube, the Darth Vader cube, um, it actually miles out that very first initial, like, um, the, the, the bite. Part. Yeah. I think that, that, the, the cooling it off and that, the little bit of water you get from the ice cube, I think actually uh, miles it out a little bit more. All right. Well, a couple of the, uh, pieces that we want to touch on. Dun, dun, dun. Smarter challenge. Smarter <laughs> challenges. <laughs> Which I failed, but uh, you guys probably wouldn't have known that since uh, oh, man, you guys didn't hear the first, didn't hear the first, the first cut. take. We're good, man. 100% <laughs> here. All right. So um, you uh, we started off with you first. You gave uh, five things. Yeah. And I, you know, with this uh, retake, I've adapted the words a little bit, saying them out loud to you. So I'm going with five things that matter a lot to me, to my brand. So what I'm trying to sell um, part of that is that I'm intelligent, uh, maybe shallow to some, but part of it would be that I'm attractive. Uh, that, that goes under stylish. We had that before. <laughs> um, that I am a mentor. That's important to me. Okay. That's another one we already had before. And reliable. Oh, that's new. Cause before you have resourceful. Yeah. And then finally, the big one to me is trustworthy. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I have let people down in the past, but when given the opportunity going back and making sure, especially if they ask me, yeah, I said that, or yeah, I did that, um, so that I can build upon that trustworthiness, that one's very important to me. Yeah, I think uh, trustworthiness is a good thing when it comes to a brand. Because um, it's not like you're going to buy a brand that's going to break on you, right? That's right. Although I trusted uh, Alienware and Dell, <laughs> and uh, apparently <laughs> after a couple months, uh, the hard drive doesn't work. But that's okay. Uh, at least they're fixing it, and that, uh, that kind of helps with the trustworthiness. Well, we will find out. Damn you, Dell. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, you can't make this stuff up. You don't have to. <laughs> um. So, likewise, with trustworthiness, um, as I was saying, that's pretty important. I know um, that's, uh, that in the, pa in the past, I've also have let some people down, probably way more than I probably should have. Um, but the best thing you can do, I guess, is just uh, you learn from those errors. Um, try to make amends as best as, you, as best as you can, and then keep moving forward. 
you know. Um, but it it's always a work in process, I think, uh, building that trust. Uh, it is hard to regain that trust when it's lost, so you definitely want to do a good enough job of uh, trying to keep it intact as much as possible, I would say. So, and uh, with that, though, you did talk about your the the shoe that brought up that, those qualities. So you yeah. might as well give that history lesson. Oh yeah, again. no, I was just talking a little bit about you know a shoe company that if I was to be a shoe one that or a shoe maker one that is very important to me probably my favorite shoe man if i could wear salvatore ferragamo's every day i would uh you know i i think you know we talked about the brief history as you mentioned it salvatore ferragamo born in 1898 emigrated to the united states at the age of 17 started out making cowboy boots ended up making shoes for the stars in hollywood um, eventually branched out and makes all sorts of clothing, shoes. I, I remember you saying that one of your p- favorite pieces of Ferragamo is one of your ties. Yeah. And, um, I agree with that. Great products, though, and a big piece with Ferragamo to me is not only is it stylish, so not only is it attractive, but it's very well made. And with his shoes, Ferragamo, um, you know, part of the intelligence piece there for him was – he didn't just want to make a good looking shoe. He wanted to make a comfortable shoe. So he did a lot of research studying how many layers of leather should be on the sole. How high should a heel be right down to the point again with style and fashion and what looks good. Um, how high of a heel should someone wear to maximize, you know, that calf appeal on a lady or the height um, on a man. So something that's not too tall, but absolutely adds to the attraction piece. Uh, comfort, durability, lots of great materials used, some of the finest leathers, um, craftsmanship. He's used all sorts of things, um, but a great product um, that's been around forever. He passed away 1960, I believe, and his sons took over. Okay. Yeah, you didn't mention that part last time. So the second round is even better. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a great product. He did a lot of research and um, wanted, I, I think that reliability piece is um, important. You know, the resourceful piece is also important, but the reliability is something if you're going to spend nowadays, I think the average pair is probably $700, right around $650, $700. If you're going to spend that kind of money on a pair of shoes, you want it to look good. And if you're someone who spends 12 hours a day on your feet, you want it to feel good too. Yes, exactly. Never going to spend that much money on <laughs> I mean, there's other things, but, you know, you can only drink so much scotch. Yeah, true that, <laughs> true that. All right. So I think uh, with mine, I uh, had a uh, vision, right? Visionary? Yes. And uh, thanks. Good thing you wrote down because I would have <laughs> forgot. <laughs> uh, visionary, positivity, um, Steady or consistent um, emotionally. Um, so, like, not getting, like, too too emotionally high or too emotionally low. Um, like you, mentorship and uh, underdog. Yeah. So, visionary, just kind of go over that. Um, you know, I think you have to have a, a good vision for people to follow you. But part of having a good vision is that uh, it has to be a vision that's big enough to where people can see themselves uh, growing inside of that vision. And as I mentioned before, I talked about Steve Jobs and Apple and how they did a really good job with their vision. And and Steve Jobs talked about, like, uh, when he first came out with Apple, like, creating a revolution. Um, and uh, he sold that so well, that vision, that uh, Apple, like they just like they're up anywhere from their iPads, iPhones, um, to their computers. Uh, that Macintosh symbol uh, is uh, is very prevalent, and they've uh, that vision is is so well sold to where people believe in it so much that uh, they're they've made diehard people that are diehard fans or diehard uh, customers, and they all buy into that uh, that vision of of uh, the revolution of whatever Apple is. And uh, I think that's a good thing to have. Being positive, uh, I think, is also a very good trait or quality to have um, because 
honestly, like we live in a very negative world. Um, you watch most uh, TV shows. A lot of TV shows have negativity. Uh, news has negativity in it. Um, so if you could be a positive light, it helps. Uh, I think it helps um, not only you succeed, but it draws people to you, um, which would then also bring us in the whole thing, the whole thing about mentorship, right? So you got to have people who like buy into your vision, right? People who are attracted to you by your positivity, right? And then, uh, and then you have, then you're able to uh, help mentor them, right? And obviously, yeah, I, to be a good mentor, uh, a factor of that is you have to be a good student, right? You just don't one day you just all of a sudden become a trainer or you don't all of a sudden become a mentor. Uh, you have to be trained or you have to mentor, you have to have a mentor yourself before you can uh, really start helping other people out. And I think a lot of those things all, all kind of sort of coincide together. And I think this also brings along the whole part about being uh, emotionally um, stable, not getting too emotionally high or too emotionally low because there are going to be peaks and valleys uh, in life. And, uh, you know, I do think, uh, you know, po- you know, positive things or, or small wins or big wins, they should be celebrated, but I don't think you should get too emotionally high in order. I think you should get too emotionally low when things go bad. There's a saying about, um, things are never as good as they seem <laughs> and things are never as bad as they seem. All right. So you want to kind of keep in that, just in that middle zone of, uh, emotional feelings. You don't want to try to, you, you don't want to try to peak above that and you don't want to drop below that, that like that little section there. Uh, but don't get me wrong. Like I said, I think wins, wins do need to be celebrated. And then, uh, underdog, um, as I was mentioning, uh, the first go around, um, I used to be kind of more like you where I like to be more stylish. Um, like especially, uh, through high school and college, as you know, um, my brand was pretty much Ralph Lauren, <laughs> <laughs> right? Socks, shirts, boxers, whatever, you know, Pants. paint slacks, uh, shoes, shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ties. Um, but, uh, I've kind of come to, as I've gotten older though, I've kind of like to take more of the, I like the more of the role of the underdog. I like, to, I like people to kind of overlook me and then kind of come out of nowhere, you know? by surprise but that's uh, that i don't know why i like that but that's kind of like how i've kind of sort of been starting on probably like the last 10 years or so all right i do remember high school man those were good years not that long ago right and uh, ladies and gentlemen do not let noah fool you this gentleman was wearing a versace tie in high school all right (laughs) (laughs) silk shirts versace tie Yes, absolutely correct with the Ralph Lauren shoes. Um, yeah, it's uh, but it's all a piece of what we want to sell of ourselves as, and that's the that's the biggest piece is if you believe in yourself in the right way. This is why this is important to me is if you believe in yourself in the right way, you do want to sell yourself because you've got something that you believe in. So things like being a mentor, absolutely. Um, being as, as you were saying, steady. So not too emotionally high or low. I absolutely agree with the low. Um, I, I try to uh, keep that one at bay as well, but I, on the flip side, and maybe this is part of like the, Hey, show off your Ferragamo tie piece is like, show the highs, like share those, bring in, um, with your visionary piece being that visionary, which I, I do believe you are. I think that's a, a greatness of yours and that energy, that excitement, you build that. And that's an additional factor that brings in the people who are looking for that in a leader, in a mentor, in someone who is steady and, um, you know, anytime you're a visionary, you, can, you could easily say, especially at the beginning of a vision, it's something new. You're an underdog. Like, <laughs> th- you, you might be doing something new, whether it's new for you or new for others. It may be a first or maybe this is you're the thousandth, but you're trying it new for you. And yeah, you're going to be an underdog. With that in question, who's your favorite underdog? If you were to think of a movie, what character is your favorite underdog? <laughs> Before I tell you who my favorite underdog is, because I think I know you want it, where you want to go with this. No, man, I want you to go whichever <laughs> way you want. Um, I think you'll know where I want, want to go with that. But before I answer that question, I do want to say the reason why I've always been a big fan of like uh, Ralph Lauren 
is because I do like that classical, more uh, conservative, conservative, uh, old money look. Like I don't like to be flashy. Um, I, I think that's why. Like uh, that's something like we've talked about. Like right, you know, before. Like when you've always been like, I want a Ferrari. I've been more like, <laughs> I just rather have a BMW. <laughs> uh, you know, nice quality, but not, but not flashy. Uh, so, and I think that just, that kind of, kind of like, that kind of like dwindled down into like underdog. <laughs> 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 so I just wanted to say like, yeah, like back then, even, even back then I was just more about nice, but classical and, and conservative versus flashy. Um, especially when, I went, especially more so when I got into college, uh, as opposed to like high school. Uh, now, as far as my favorite underdog, uh, if I had to go think of like underdog with movies, um, I would say it would definitely have to be uh, Stallone and the Rocky <laughs> series. Um, I think one of the best, uh, there's actually like two really good parts in, in the Rocky series. Um, one is in, um, I think, Balboa. Um, and then there's a uh, another one. I think the other. I think the other one is there. One called Rocky Balboa, and the other one called Balboa, something like that. You know, there's so many <laughs> Rocky movies. I know there's at least one of those two. I am not positive about both. Okay, so I know one of them is called Balboa. Okay. Um, it, I, I'm not sure which one it is, but it's the one where he comes. Like, there's the one where he comes out of retirement. Yes. And uh, his son yes. is like saying, like, I can't win because of you. I'm in your shadow. And he's like, basically, like, hey, you know, life's not all sunshine and rainbows. Like, life's going to be basically beat the shit, yeah. beat the crap out of you. <laughs> basically, <laughs> and, Rocky Five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, and it's it's not about how like uh, it's not about whether or how hard it, how uh, hard you can get hit, hit but how hard. You- get hit and get back up and keep going forward <laughs> right something like that so that was a good one and, and this could even be with the same movie I, I could be i could be wrong though but there's another part where i think it might be a different movie but um maria his like the like the little girl he's like uh the, the little girl maria or something like that she's all growing up or whatever and he starts hanging out with her and her son and stuff a little bit and uh he talks about like I think he's talking to her and says something about like, Hey, don't let anyone ever tell you who you are or, or like knock you down. You know, you're, you're good enough. Basically. Um, um, you're better than what you think you are. So I think, uh, I think if you watch the Rocky movies, uh, there are a lot of good, uh, um, good pieces of, of, of advice in there. So as a series, I would say Rocky is probably one of my favorite underdogs, but that may not be my favorite underdog movie. Oh, what's the favorite underdog movie? What is the underlying hidden movie? I say the favorite, uh, my favorite underdog movie of all time is probably A Night's Tale. Oh, man. I lo- we talked about this briefly. I love this movie. Heath Ledger um, does a phenomenal job in it. Yeah, good movie. Um, do you have a favorite line from that movie? Um, you know, I really don't. I, I don't have a favorite line. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, I, I really love. I love the music that goes along with the movie, but I love the whole fact of like how they, how he just like he knew what a dream was. He wanted to be a knight. His dad said, "I can't give this to you, so I'm gonna give you to a knight, and you go make your dreams happen." And as soon as his opportunity came about, which like if he would have gotten caught, he you know would have been killed or whatever. But he jumped at the opportunity and he just he went for it. He just uh, tossed everything to the wind, and uh, he went to go grasp after his dreams. And he went after. It. And I think uh, that that just shows kind of like uh, if you believe in something a lot, and even though you're an underdog and you probably have no business being able to achieve what uh, what it is you want, that it's possible, it can happen. You just have to, there's going to be no right time ever in life to, to take that leap forward of faith. You just have to do it, and then you just work on it from there. And, like, 
it wasn't the opportune time for him, but you know, the the night that he was squiring for died and he's like, Screw it, I'll just throw on the I'll throw on the armor and we'll just make a go at it. And if they were found out right then there, he could have died. But he took that risk. And uh, you know, this comes with that whole big risk, big reward type of thing. Absolutely. So my favorite line from this movie is when he takes a beating, a pretty good uh, beating, and he is told, you have been weighed, you have been measured, and you have been left wanting. I love that line. Many times in life, I, I get beat. Um, I don't always win every little thing, but one thing I can tell you is if I'm left wanting, it's not the, the wanting just to win, it's wanting to win. I don't give up. Yeah, if you also look at that movie, though, it shows that he trained his butt off to achieve the skill level that he got. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And that is... And he, like, built, and he built loyalty. There you go. He built loyalty. <laughs> and on top of that, with his vision, it was, it was large enough for his comrades to buy into the vision and go along with it, even though that put them all at risk. I mean, you could say he had figured out a perfect brand for his time. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> think about it, right? He was a visionary. He was positive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Heath Ledger, phenomenal actor, really was, played that role superbly. And I agree with you. It's a great movie. Definitely goes into that role as the underdog. Um, but Driven wants it much like Rocky. And with Rocky, man, that whole series is good. I Except for five, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. Whatever that one was with Tommy Gunn. Yeah. That uh, one was terrible. Watch all of them except that one. Yeah. Rocky one, he goes in and... He loses, you know, though. Oh, yeah, he takes a beating. But, you know, again, he's weighed, he's measured, he's left wanting, but he goes back at it, so he still wants it. He's just not wanting. He wants it. He's going to go for it. Um, Rocky two, a little bit different story. Uh, Rocky three, man, Mr. T. <laughs> Bubber Lane. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. How does Ivan he... Drago, number four. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I think number four is one of my favorites, if not my favorite, but I'll tell you the creeds, uh, creed oh. one and two are phenomenal. Uh, yes, kind of are. a reboot. I did. I, so I loved, well. I loved, the first Creed, uh, that one was done really well. Plus, I love the fact that, you know, I'd spent some time in Philly. So, like, oh, watching yeah. that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know that place <laughs> or whatever. Uh, I've seen that over there. Uh, Creed 2, it was it was good. Not as good as the first one. But, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I, I really liked the Creed part of the series. I think one of the things that is you look at Rocky 1, and, and he was an underdog too. Yeah, Rocky one and Rocky two, and then Creed one and Creed two. One of those pieces that is part of a hero's tale, or, or you know, um, a person's journey. I, I don't want to just say a man's journey, but a person's journey is there are those times when you lose, and both Balboa and Creed lose, but they don't give up. And bigger and more important to that is. They do what they do because they have to. Now, that is also weird and twisted. You could say that about a, a, a heroin addict. I, well, I didn't did some more heroin because I had to. Um, they felt this need, this drive. Um, different type of drive, a little <laughs> bit more positive. I mean, they're getting beat up, but different type of drive, different type of positive. Um, both of them, though, at the end of the day, needed to know they gave 100% and that they could do it. And... Luckily, both of them victorious at the ends of those <laughs> movies. Um, to well, of do course, Creed job. would be. He started to train like Rocky. Yeah. <laughs> they learned to take a, take a beating and then all of a sudden beat everyone up when they lost all their energy. Right. And I, I, for me, Sylvester Stallone, if you're out there, you ever want to come on the show, please do. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, if you ever hear our show, you want to come on our, our podcast. Come uh, drink Sylvester. some scotch with us. Yeah, we, we, we will be more than happy yeah. to join us. You know, we want to be expendable too. <laughs> But no, seriously, um, you did such a great job writing all of these scripts, all of these movies to really show different pieces, the strengths and fragility of human humans, uh, humanity. 
of what it's like to win and what you might face with that, what it's like to lose. You know, Rocky had won so many. Well, he, like, pretty much lost everything. He, like, had to sell his dog and everything, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. And then after Rocky became successful, he was able to go buy his dog back. Yeah, it, it's a great story of, of his life, but also the movies um, give you hope because of that underdog piece. Yo, Adrian. <laughs> Oh, I, I refuse that challenge because it is no challenge. Um, <laughs> it it they, just great movies um, that really show the dynamics of you know I, I'm gonna say you know what it's like to be any one of us, what it's like to have adversity and then have to be resilient and adaptable. Um, these people don't just give up. No, they don't. All right, so. Uh yeah, there's that. All right, I'm going to bounce back to the scotch for just a minute. Okay. Definitely continues to build on the smooth factor for me. I think the more you drink, the more smooth it gets. Yeah, either that or it's airing out and the alcohol is <laughs> evaporating. <laughs> one of the two. Um, but you had mentioned that citrus and the pie crust. And, man, I, I'm telling you, I am tasting that right now. Um, I, I am still getting that little sense of malt. Uh, as a kid, I loved malted milk balls. Love that flavor. Enjoying it here. Again, um, super smooth at the end. Uh, this could actually be a really great scotch to go with pie. Could. We need yeah. to start, start keeping these desserts in, in, at hand so we can <laughs> just go grab a piece of tiramisu or cherry pie, blueberry pie. Blueberry pie is my favorite. Um, oh, you know what my favorite is? Blueberry banana pie. Yeah, I have never tried such delicious pie, but you have mentioned it to me in the past. It's pretty good. Bomb. <laughs> All right. So talking about these different pieces. Thank you, Sherry, for having your daughter, Camille, give me that recipe. <laughs> Camille, you're awesome. I miss you guys. Hopefully you're loving Georgia. Yeah. Why don't you guys just make a couple of those pies overnight them to us and we'll review your pies on Scotch Hour. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here's another piece, another movie. Definitely, you could say there's an underdog in it. Um, the Terminator. Do you remember the Terminator? I do remember the Terminator. I'll be back. There you go. Arnold Schwarzenegger, literally larger than life. The guy is huge. I, I think he must have weighed 250 pounds in this movie. Mr. Uh, Universe at the time, I believe. Yeah, he's lifting weights, doing some steroids, who knows what else. Looking great, though. Thank you, Arnold. <laughs> um, being the ideal specimen of what a man or person can achieve. Um, but back to the movie. Great movie. 1984, James Cameron, Arnold Schwarzenegger plays the Terminator. Um, and the Terminator is sent back in time to terminate Sarah Connor before she has her son, John Connor. Who is the leader of the rebels. In the future. Fighting the robots. Who sends back Kyle Reese to protect his mother after he finds out the Terminator has been sent to the past. And then you find out Kyle Reese from the future is John Connor's father. Now, <laughs> I see this as I see any possibility with time and space travel that once you go back in time, you restart a clock. So I wouldn't say you necessarily restart a clock. Um, did you ever watch, uh, was it um, the Avengers? Yes. I think the Avengers does a great job talking about that when they go get the infinity stones. I think you're right. I think the, so yeah, yeah, like the line, right? It's leaning yes. here like this. And then when they go back to grab the infinity stone, it knows it's no longer linear. It breaks off into a new timeline. Right. So that's what happens with with, with uh, John Connor and Reese. Yes. So it creates a new timeline. Timeline. There's a ripple. Um, you can go into a lot of different pieces here with the multiverse and different timelines and different things going on at the same time. But the ripple creates a change in past. Right. So now someone from the future is the father of someone who hasn't been born yet and who also hasn't been born yet theoretically in the original timeline, but is now in the past. Right. So I don't really think it changes John's destiny too much because that, even though that's been changed, like obviously Reese wasn't his first 
father in the original timeline. But it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, because John sends Reese back. Reese tells Sarah everything that John is, and then from that point forward, when she gets pregnant, she knows that her son is supposed to be the savior of humankind. Correct. So she does everything possible to train her son. So it doesn't matter who actually is the sire, if you will, right? Of, of, uh, <laughs> of John. Of John Connor. Of John Connor. Because once he gets sent, sent, once he sent back, it is now a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it doesn't matter if that timeline really diverted. Because, uh, like, it, it depends, I guess, like how big of the diversion would, would have been, right? If they really truly wanted to maybe kill John Connor, why not go kill Reese, right? Go back in time and kill Reese so the Reese doesn't, isn't able to go back. Or even that, like if they really truly wanted, like, here's a here's a question: If you're the Terminators, right? <laughs> if you're this, if you're the if you're Skynet, if you're Skynet, and you're this AI. Why not just go back and kill like an ancestor from the eighteen hundreds, where they have like no possibility of having any kind of technology to beat you? That's a really good question, but that's too forward <laughs> thinking. Like uh, honestly, here here's the next answer: is guess what? John Connor every time sends back somebody else through time. To save his mom. Oh, wait. He literally actually does that because the second time around, he sends back the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And now for his mom, for him. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, interesting. And then thankfully, we don't have to see the Terminator become John Connor's father. That would have been a little awkward. <laughs> well, do you think the AI uh, robot uh, Terminator actually like, produces semen? I mean, anything is possible. These guys were advanced. <laughs> but just think about that. Um, so now, as the storyline for all of those of you guys have seen it, it, they eventually take enough action so that Skynet is essentially stalled. They create a different future. It's paused. I don't yeah. think it like stalled because Skynet still goes online um, in uh, the third chapter. Uh, and the second one, right? They do go to the uh, doctor's uh, uh, the doctor's home, and then they go over to what is some dime? What is it called? Endime? Terad no, I think Teradyne or something like that. The name of the company where they go back to find the arm and the chip. And the chip, yeah. So they do destroy the arm and the chip, but I think what everyone forgets is that Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the one that was, that was sent back to protect John Connor, his arm was never really destroyed. Yeah. His arm was still, his arm was actually just cut off. Broken uh, in the automobile accident, essentially. Was it the automobile uh, no, accident? it was in a, in a cog. There okay. At, at the, uh, there's like a, his arm gets, gets caught in a wheel or a cog or something like that, and then he had, has to rip it off. But it never falls into the, into the molten... Uh, steel or whatever so that never got melted so there's still an arm out there so there is a way for whatever that company is something i know it ends in dying that's all i know <laughs> uh but th there is still a, an arm out there for them to create skynet and uh, an advanced technology off of all right so here comes the next question if that's what you're saying and proposing that they they need the arm or the chip to create that technology, where did it come from the first time? Probably still came from humans. It's a longer time to develop. All right. So all they're trying to do is beat the system, change the timeline, change history. Yeah. I mean, honestly, uh, to, I guess, kind of quote the Borg, resistance is futile. <laughs> 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 if you like Star Trek, but uh, yeah, I don't think uh, them going to steal the arm or the chip really makes that much of a difference. Uh, it was already in the in the natural timeline; it was already going to be produced anyways. It delays artificial intelligence taking over, as opposed to stops the possibility of right. I don't think there was going to be a way for them to stop it because there's probably more than just one company that was working on artificial intelligence, anyways. Uh, that's a good point. And Elon Musk, just a little bit more intelligent than either one of us, um, actually has stated that 
AI, the future of artificial intelligence, scares him. Um, yeah, scares he says he says that we're opening up uh, like basically uh, doorways to demons and stuff. Like, and I don't think he's a like, religious guy, but he's basically saying like we're basically open up the doorway to hell. Well, all of our hells are different. <laughs> it's the hell of the upside down sinners. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, if you really want to think about it, like with AI, um, think about what the Chinese are currently doing, right? They're using AI right now with Google to do facial recognition and do what's called credits. Uh, it's like a social scoring. So if you talk badly, like on social media about the government or you don't pay like a bill on time or whatever, that, that takes points away from your social score and they track that all with AI and then it, then it restricts you there's people who because their social score is so low they can't even go shopping uh, or they can't go on on the train um, so it's not like uh, it is it will be a it will be a, a hell of a, some sort speaking of hells do you remember big trouble in little China <laughs> <laughs> Wow, we're really jumping around here. <laughs> All right, back to the Terminator. <laughs> what about Big Trouble in Little China? Just the hell of the upside down sinners. <laughs> lots of hells. The Chinese have lots of hells. <laughs> <laughs> Terminator, though. Okay. You and I both agree. We can understand and see the possibility of the timeline. We don't question it. I have met people <laughs> who truly question the logic behind it. I think it just depends on how you look at it. I mean, if you're trying to say, like, John Connor's dad was Kyle Reese from the very beginning, and then, then you're talking about the whole chicken versus egg theory, uh, you're not going to come up with an answer, and you're not going get to get a good one. Uh, but if you understand kind of like the theory that they use in the Avengers, where you have, like, the normal timeline, but then something diverts it, and it creates a new timeline, then, yeah, it's easy to understand. I'm going to choose a whole different strategy. John Connor wanted his mom to have hams, knew that they were sending a Terminator back to kill her, and found the closest guy that could possibly be his dad and said, hey, you're my daddy. Go save my mom. <laughs> <laughs> they were good friends. There you go. That's all it takes. Hey, you're about uh, his height. Do you think uh, and, uh, Connor Reese uh, knew? Do you think he knew that he was John's dad before he was sent back? Oh, I don't, I mean, how do you know that? You, you, no is the answer. So that is a great question, but you can't know that if you haven't experienced it. And yet. what do you think he, <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what do you think went through his mind after he got his mom, uh, got uh, Sarah Connor pregnant? Well, he, he, like, he never knew he did that. He died before that. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he did drop his load. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you know what's the first thing that goes through a fly's mind when he hits a windshield? <laughs> 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 That's right, his bottom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what are you thinking of the scotch? Um, it's going down really smooth. Um, you know, if I wasn't uh, watching one of my drinking habits right now, I'd probably be uh, three glasses in. You know what I think this would be phenomenal with? S'mores. s'mores? Perfect for the summer. We have to revisit this. Glenfiddich okay. 12 and s'mores. Glenfiddich 12 and s'mores. Sounds good. Good, good, good. All right. All right. How's your XRP doing? Well, it took a dip. And I think, uh, I'm not sure which, depending on the market you look at, I think I got it. It may have dropped below a dollar, uh, but now I think it's back up to like a dollar thirty-five. All right, so it's still you still you're still on the right track. Oh yeah, it's still on the right track. Um, in fact, there's some uh, some market analysts who believe that by the end of June it'll be up to forty-seven dollars. All right. Well, as I shared with you, you have me right on the line. I am literally walking the top of the fence um, deciding whether or not I'm going to buy some of this. So stay tuned, but it is possible for the first time ever. I'm like, man, this cryptocurrency thing. Could I, be I will thing. say this though, uh, no matter what cryptocurrency you are looking at, um, 
or if you're looking just to play the stock market in general, I would expect that there will be one to two more big dips coming. And uh, you want to buy the dips. Yeah. <laughs> when the dips happen. So um, I would just say be aware of that. Um, even with the two dips that are coming, uh, if you still buy right now with XRP being like $1.35, um, if you're not already leveraged into XRP, then $1.35 is still a very good price point if you're considering that the market analysts might be correct of it being anywhere from 7 to $47. And honestly, a lot of them think it's going to go like way higher than that after like two, three years down the line. So, I don't know, it just kind of depends. This is not financial advice. But <laughs> I am not telling you to buy anything. And uh, if you are taking any kind of recommendations from someone you're watching on YouTube, um, you may want to... Uh, <laughs> Find a different channel. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you just want to make sure you do your own research before you buy. And never invest more than you can afford. I don't want us to get in trouble for someone saying, like, hey, they say that I should buy this. So, there you go. All right. Got to get that disclaimer up there. Yeah. Bloop. Got to get the disclaimers. Because, you know, people sue for anything stupid nowadays. It's true. Don't drink and drive, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do not drink and drive. All right. Now, as we talk about different forms of entertainment media, you and I were also talking about ultimately a TV show that was based on a book written by Neil Gaiman, American Gods. Phenomenal book. I don't know if you ever heard the book. I have not. It's a great book. book yet. Yeah. I actually have a copy on order on the way right now. It's supposed to be here in three days. Yeah, you'll enjoy the book. It's uh, just know like the book uh, is more condensed. Um, like uh, basically what happens in American Gods over like basically two seasons is basically what happens in the book. It does vary. Uh, there's obviously, you know, anytime you have a, you know, a TV show or a movie and you look at a novel or a book, um, it's going to have some variances in it. But I do really, I love the concept of, of American gods and how, like, gods come over from the old world, whether it be uh, Europe, uh, yeah, whether it be Europe, uh, India, Africa, or wherever, and the gods actually gain power uh, by how many people uh, believe in them or worship them. And I, and I think it's kind of cool, too. They talk about how uh, you have the old gods, right? And then you have new gods, like technology, media. Uh, was it Mr. Is it Mr. World? Is that what his name is? Or yes. Is, yeah. So uh, I think it's a really neat concept. Um, it's very interesting in how it is a war between the gods. You could say they're basically just politicians. You could. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shadow Moon is uh, is technically the main character. Um, it happens to be the son of Wednesday, which is uh, Odin. And uh, if you know anything about uh, Norse mythology... Uh, then you'll know who Odin is uh, or Wednesday. Um, but it's actually kind of cool how they do bring in multiple gods from different uh, myths and religions and it, stuff. It is. I've only seen season one. After that, I got rid of Cable for a few years and still haven't gotten it back. But I am looking forward to the book. Season one was a great season. I agree with you. Um, basically, if you will being believed in becomes your power and really you could say these gods much like our topic our last smarter challenge create their own brand and they're trying to get people to believe in them so what is my brand do people believe in odin do people believe in any of these gods and that becomes their power so creating that brand yeah and i think if you look at um even today, if you don't even look at uh, the TV show American Gods, there's actually been a bigger p 
push um, recently in the last couple of years uh, about Norse uh, mythology being a, a religion again. And oddly enough, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I know May the 4th <laughs> is coming up, but there's even a religion about the Jedi Order. There's a Jedi church out there. What would you say was your hook when watching season one? Uh, Sweeney. Okay. The leprechaun. <laughs> Sweeney like, is awesome. I agree. <laughs> the uh, guy, I don't know. I don't know the actor's name that played Sweeney, but uh, he did an awesome job. He does. Uh, how wild is it that some dead person could steal his coin? Oh, uh, you talking about uh, Shadow Moon's... Uh, uh, Girlfriend, if wife. you will. It is yeah. his wife. Because <laughs> he calls her dead wife throughout the whole series. Yeah, I, I only say girlfriend because I saw this funny meme this morning. And this lady posts, this is the, the series of texts I got from, uh, got last night, is how she puts it. And the first text is from her drunk husband. You're the most beautiful girlfriend I ever had. And her response is, I'm your wife. And his response is, oh, my God, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just a little bit of light humor. It caught my attention, and I'm still laughing about it. <laughs> I think you'll uh, I think you'll like season two and season three. Um, season three goes a little bit more into Norris uh, mythology, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, it goes into a little bit about purgatory. But it, it's a uh, there's a new leprechaun. Um, Sweeney is not the leprechaun anymore. Um, let's see, but it's a good series. I liked it a lot. All right, so Shadow Moon, great character, great in that. Still not my favorite underdog. My favorite underdog in all movies, and I agree with you. Sylvester Stallone does a great job, whether it be Rambo, Rocky, The Expendables. Um, definitely plays the underdog well understands the draw and the attraction to that writes to it well he himself was an underdog nobody would finance this guy's movie he not only made it into a movie but a franchise and uh, a piece of our culture today but mine is going to be so much more modern than that mine is going to be the mandalorian How is a Mandalorian the underdog? <laughs> because he's facing the entire empire <laughs> that doesn't any longer exist. Okay, I guess. Because uh, I guess he is battling the empire to, to save uh, Grogu. Yes, Grogu. Um, but, man, again, you could say... And we don't know how this series ends. Disney will continue to keep that from us. Thankfully, please get at least like 10 years out of this. I need my Mandalorian. But uh, I think Mandalorian is only going to be a four, uh, four season deal. Disney, please make it 10. I need 10 years out well, of Well, here's the thing. You know, like <laughs> Disney has already screwed that up by firing Gina Carano. Yeah. But there's rumors that they're going to be hiring Gina Carano back. And so John Favreau had to uh, basically do a lot of rewrites to get her like to rewrite her at, to write her rewrite her out of the Mandalorian and if they do hire her back and the reason they're probably going to be hiring her back is because Nat Geo has a has a show that has Gina Carano in it and so that's a Disney property so now that gives them a way to hire her back so if that happens, then there might be a longer delay with the Mandalorian for season three and four Oof. for them to rewrite her back into uh, the Mandalorian. And the really cool part is John Favreau is supposedly going to be taking Catherine Kennedy's spot as the new president of Star Wars. Interesting. Which, if you like the Mandalorian, I just love it. Grogu. Uh, let's face it. Who? Whose heart hasn't Grogu touched? <laughs> <laughs> if you love the Mandalorian, then uh, obviously you're going to love the fact that Jon Favreau will be the new president since this is pretty much his baby. It is. He's done a phenomenal job. Um, colossal production. Yeah. Uh, and if you... It, I wouldn't necessarily call him the underdog, but sure. I You know the way I saw, I saw it as? I saw it as a... Uh, Spaghetti Western. Yes. 
meets uh, sci-fi. Uh, I agree with you, but man, how do you not see him as the underdog? Like rethink I mean, the first few episodes. The I, guy's wearing tin foil armor. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I mean, I would I would never have thought of him as an underdog, but I get it. Like I understand where you're going with it. Yeah, like he he ultimately has very few friends. The his friends are the other underdogs. Mandalorians, and uh, this is the way. That's you know, it's uh, well, even at that though, they weren't really his friends. They didn't really care too much for him. No, but man, did they not come back and save his tail end in all the right times? <laughs> they totally did. And then, Trustworthiness, uh, man. And then, like, Dinner Chrono became his uh, his buddy. And, uh, and then, uh, was it Carl, Carl Weathers? Was that who it was? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they became buddies, too. Yeah. Those, I, those are, like, his only friends now. Yeah. I, I, well, I yeah. Well, and now I, Bubba I'm, Fat is too. There you go. Did you see? Did you see all? all yeah. Three? Oh, I have seen them. And okay, man. I have to ask you now that we're talking about Star <laughs> Wars and the Mandalorian. <laughs> what did you think of uh, when uh, Luke comes in, in the very last episode? Okay, so not just Luke, but uh, well, I guess it was just Luke. But the assumption. Um, so let me tell you. Let me not get off track here. My question was, and, and people have given me answers, different answers, but my question was, okay, so when in the world in, in time did this take place? That's really what I thought. And I understand there are different pieces to that, but my mind was pretty well blown. What did you think? I thought that's how... Luke Skywalker should have been treated in the uh, the last trilogy. I think they did everything right by Luke Skywalker in that one little like teeny clip, teeny clip. Because like the Last Jedi, I'll, I'll just admit it, like that was crap. Uh, anybody who likes the Last Jedi, they that's, could all go to hell. I still haven't seen it. Because it's the worst Star <laughs> Wars. It's, it's worst Star Trek, uh, Star Wars ever. Uh, like, like. That is not Luke Skywalker. How do you go from a guy who believes that his dad, who's the biggest bad baddie in the whole universe. <laughs> nice save. <laughs> right? He's the biggest baddie, right? The evilest dude other than the and other than the Emperor. I mean, you can say he actually saves the day at the end. He's the only Right, but he never guy. lost faith that his that his dad had good in him. Correct. Right. So how are you gonna tell me that that same person has a has a dream about his nephew? And decides to go kill his nephew, and then then decides to go to a island all by himself and drink weird ass alien green milk from an animal's tit. Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of drugs. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, what they showed there is the was the proper Luke Skywalker, and I was super excited about it. And uh, they totally did a really good job with it. I think the other thing they showed is kids and adults. Don't do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a lot more we could talk about with the Mandalorian. Um, I'm just going to tell you my favorite part of that last episode, season two, is when Grogu looks at the Mandalorian and asks if it's okay if he goes. That was pretty impactful to me. I have not forgotten that. Um, I think to me, actually, I don't think to me. I know to me that was an impactful moment because it showed you're you're mentioning Luke Skywalker's treatment of uh, respect that showed respect from Grogu to the Mandalorian of hey like he, he, no matter who was really my dad you, you're basically my dad man is this okay and if you say no I'm cool but hey is this okay. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that was to be expected. I mean, because uh, Ahsoka said that that was, like, that he basically saw him as his dad. So uh, that did not uh, surprise me or anything. All right. Well, I just, I enjoyed that. I thought that was well played into that episode. It was. It was. It made for a touching moment for those people who need a touching moment. I will say, I think the this, the episode with Ahsoka that was freaking kick butt too. It was I loved pretty it. Good. Like, uh, did you ever watch the Clone War cartoons? I actually have it. I used to watch it with my son all the time. Nice. <laughs> did you watch Rebels too? 
Uh, I think I think I've watched them all, but I'm not positive. So yeah, I think if you watch The Mandalorian, you have to have at least a little bit of knowledge of the Clone Wars cartoons and uh, the Rebels cartoons. That one, especially when you come to the second season. Yeah, I agree with you. When Ahsoka came into the screen, delighted. And uh, what's her name? Uh, some Dawson. Anyways, whoever the actress was that played uh, Ahsoka, um, Rosar- Rosario Dawson, uh, she did a phenomenal job. She did way better. I didn't, at first, I didn't like her as uh, being Ahsoka, but then after seeing how she played the part, I was like, yep, that's Ahsoka. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case, uh, I think it's time for her to kind of wrap up and do our last Smarter Challenges. Right? All right. So my my turn this week for smarter challenges. Smarter challenges. Smarter challenges. So my smarter challenge is going to be for you to watch, and this is anybody who listens to us, a YouTube video called The Strangest Secret. And it's by Earl uh, Earl Nightingale. Should be like a black and white video. All right. How long is this video? 30 minutes. Oh, that's nothing. Yeah. And you could be doing other, you could be be bopping around doing other stuff while you listen to it, but just, just listen to it. And, uh, let me know what you think next week. All right. All right. Um, I guess with that, I'll sign off by saying once again, we are on Podbean. Spotify, Amazon Music for audio. Those will usually drop earlier, although this week might be later because of uh, computer issues. Video drops uh, Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Mountain on both YouTube and Rumble. And uh, please like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy our podcast. And uh, we do have um, now the ability for people to uh, donate to us uh, through... um, uh, what is it called? Do you remember what it's called? Oh, man, no. <laughs> oh, man, no. <laughs> I just had a brain fart. I forgot what it's called. But anyways, uh, there it, there will be a link uh, if you want to donate like a dollar to our show or whatever. Um, and uh, we would greatly appreciate that if you do enjoy our entertainment and our fun banter back and forth. So with that, I'll wish you guys a great evening. Jesse, your final uh, words? You know, I think Noah has always put it best. Please share with us your feedback, your suggestions. Um, I'm looking forward to the Glenn Fittick 12 with some s'mores this summer out back. And um, thank you for your time. Um, Noah, thank you for coming over, for sharing dinner with me, and for making my evening more enjoyable. Awesome. Great. Have a great night, guys. Cheers. Cheers.